A warm welcome to the program. We begin with updates for shooting that happened this morning at a school in Vantar in Finland. A 12-year-old boy has been detained and considered a suspect in the shooting of three other students at the Viatola school. One of the casualties is dead. The other two remain seriously wounded. Police say they arrived at the school within nine minutes of the incident intended to the three victims. Children had just returned to class following the long Easter weekend, and all those involved are thought to have been in the sixth grade. Police also say the suspects ran off as soon as police arrived and was eventually detained in a calm manner in the northern Siltamaki district of Helsinki. The suspect had been holding a firearm, which they had taken from him. He admitted carrying out the shooting. Authorities have now opened an investigation into murder and attempted murder. The day began bright and early for many Senegalese today as Basir Diomaye Faye was sworn in as president of the country in the capital, Dakar. With the ceremony, Faye becomes the fifth president of the West African country. Earlier this month, the 44-year-old won the delayed election, securing 54% of the vote ahead of his main challenger, Amadou Ba, from the ruling coalition. Heads of state from around the continent, including Nigeria's president, Bola Tinubu, as well as other leaders on the continent, attended the ceremonies. Well, we have someone who did attend the ceremonies and who can tell us all about it. The VOA's regional correspondent, Mariama Diallo, joins us from Dakar, the Senegalese capital. Mariama, great to see you. Great to see you as well. Thanks for having me today. And you're fresh from the inaugural ceremony uh, that announced uh, Basir Fay as president of Senegal, putting stamp to the elections that almost divided the country. Thank God it finally happened. Tell us about the mood in, I suppose, it's a main stadium in Dakar where this happened. Yes, it actually happened at the uh, International uh, Conference Center uh, of Abdou Diouf. Abdou Diouf is actually it's named after the second president of Senegal. It's located in Djamnyadjo, about an hour away from Dakar city center. I got to tell you, when I was coming back, it took me maybe two and a half hours or three hours being stuck in traffic trying to get back into the city. Uh, but there was a lot of ex excitement, obviously, uh, from the people uh, who voted uh, for Basiru Jamaifai. Obviously, he won a little over 54% of the vote. Uh, but I think it was excitement uh, maybe across the country. I'm sure, uh, you know, there were 17 other candidates, people who didn't win, uh, you know, you know, are probably just digesting their defeats. But I think the Senegalese people are relieved. When you talk to them, uh, you know, when you see their faces, when you see how they feel, uh, you can uh, tell that they're just glad it took place after months of political turmoil, political crisis. Uh, you know, they didn't know if uh, this country that they've always known uh, as this beacon of democracy in this region uh, was going to, to pull it off, and they did. Yeah, they did finally. I mean, the rest of Africa held its breath while Senegal went through its short period of political crisis. We've seen this before with Abdullah Wade. We also saw it again uh, with Macky Sall. Did he attend the ceremony and did he stay till the end? No, he actually did not attend the ceremony. I think this is usually, uh, if you're talking about Macky Sall, uh, this is usually how it happens in uh, in Senegal. Uh, usually, um, sorry, I think I just have another life that is calling me. I apologize for that. Uh, but usually, uh, you know, the swearing in happens at a place, and this time it was at CCAD. Uh, basically, the president of the Constitutional Council uh, will bring uh, brings Jamai uh, Fai, Basir Jamai Fai in and swears him in. He takes the oath of office, and then he made a speech. And then after that, while the president was waiting, actually, in the presidential palace here, then uh, Mr. Uh, the newest president heads to the palace, and then that's where they kind of meet and kind of, uh, you know, just it's, it's like, you know, I'm coming in, I'm the newcomer. Uh, basically, you'll have, I'm sure, uh, as other presidents have yeah. done this, the U.S., 
Europe and other places in Africa uh, basically do the exchange of keys. I, I don't know if it's keys, basically do the, the last exchange before the outgoing president leaves and then the new president comes in. Mariama, we understand your hot cake today, so we're just going to let you go after this last question, which is what was uh, what were the main points of uh, Mr. Fay's message to the people as he accepted uh, uh, his office? Well, I think he took it uh, very seriously in his first speech after being uh, sworn in. Uh, he talked about the fact that he understood that when Senegalese people voted, uh, they voted for a change, and he did not uh, want to take it lightly. He knows that people voted for a systemic change and that he was going to work tirelessly for this country uh, to move it forward. Uh, so I think, you know, he talked about a lot of different things. He talked about, uh, you know, the independence of the justice system. He talked about trying to alleviate this high cost of living uh, that uh, the ordinary Senegalese has uh, been going through. Uh, you know, so many things. I'm sure there are a lot of priorities uh, that he has and he will have priorities within priorities. I guess the, the population is just going to have uh, to give it some time to give it, you know, whatever, you know, I don't know how long, uh, but at least, uh, you know, give him time to settle in and figure out what he's going to tackle first, because there are uh, a lot of things uh, to work on, uh, not just for this African country. It's uh, it's every country when you come in as a new president. Mariama, thank you again. We know you have to run off. Thank you for reporting on today's inaugural ceremony. Thank you so much for having me. And we'll be returning to the African continent in just a few minutes. But 29 people at least have been killed in a fire in a nightclub in Turkey. A masquerade club in the basement of a high-rise building in Istanbul was closed and being renovated during the day. Istanbul Governor David Gull said the fire broke out just after midday, adding that the cause was not yet clear. He said the victims of the fire were thought to have been involved in the renovation work. Five people have been arrested in connection with the fire as investigations continue. They include three workplace officials, the nightclub manager and the manager of the renovations. Firefighters and other first responders surrounded the charred and smoking entrance to the club, which occupies two floors underneath a 16-story residential building in the city's Gerettepe district. The United Kingdom and the United States have signed a landmark deal, the first bilateral agreement of its kind to work together on testing advanced artificial intelligence. According to the agreement, both countries will work together on developing robust methods for evaluating the safety of AI tools and the systems that underpin them. UK Tech Minister Michelle Donnellan said in her words, it is the defining technology challenge of our generation both countries created AI safety institutions which aim to evaluate open and closed source AI systems. Well, former U.S. President Donald Trump has posted a $175 million bond in his New York civil fraud case, averting asset seizures by the state. Now, in February, the former president was found to have fraudulently inflated his assets and was ordered to pay a $464 million penalty. Posting bond means New York's Attorney General cannot enforce a penalty by freezing bank accounts or taking property until his appeals are heard. Mr. Trump has constantly denied any wrongdoing, saying the trial is a political sabotage. He was originally ordered to post bond amounting to the full penalty, but it was reduced to $175 million last week after his lawyers said it was impossible to secure a bond of that size. However, if the three judges on the appeal panel rule against him, he'll have to come up with a full $464 million or risk the dismantling of his fabled property empire. Let's bring in Channel Television's Maria Birch is in Washington. Maria, I guess you're on the go. Uh, Trump claims to have to have lots of money. I remember him saying that. I think it was recently, probably last week. He said it time and again. So why why a 175 million dollar bond instead of 434 as requested by the courts? 
Well, um, yes, it is definitely significantly lower. Uh, there was a judge, this, this case was brought forth to see if that was a fair judgment uh, for a bond amount. And it was for after further review by the courts, it was reduced to $175 million. Um, and so that uh, allowed him obviously to be able to secure the additional funding as we all knew and heard that it was going to be very difficult for him to underwrite the 400, the over $400 million dollar request initially um, from an insurance company, but that same insurance company that was not able to underwrite that uh, was able to underwrite uh, this new $175 million amount. Uh, the challenge, though, is that the question is, if that bond has to be cashed in, is it secure enough uh, that that would be in the insurance company is stating that uh, the former president has bought forth cash collateral? Um, and what that actually looks like and means, I think, is the further questioning. And if there were any bonds that the uh, former president has used uh, as the insurance company is underwriting and confirming that that amount um, is available for the bond. So this will allow him, obviously, to be able to appeal the decision um, and hopefully from his standpoint, not be accountable uh, for paying that very large judgment uh, that was brought forth. But this looks like a fine dance. The former president is uh, playing with his supporters. I mean, he comes out boldly and declares, you know, that this is nothing and this is a political witch, witch hunt. And then he goes behind the scenes and here he is uh, complying uh, with the courts. But but this decision to pay 175 million dollars it is to his advantage isn't it yes this is substantially less um and and the um the estimate and the projections were that he would have had property seized uh, because he would have not been able to secure a bond of that amount um and so that is i think where we're seeing the difference here is that at this point he is um now not seeing his property seized he's not seeing other types of judgments so he really had no choice in this circumstance but to come up with the 175 million if he wanted to ensure his property and all of his other assets were not um, being seized as a result of this. Maria, this does not mean the case has gone away, is it? Is, isn't it? Um, Trump still has to pay, I guess, the balance. Um, but when do we see any further developments on uh, this particular issue? Well, what this will allow him to do is to appeal the case. He's going to obviously try to appeal and not have to be responsible, as you stated, for the full amount. Um, and if he is able to successfully appeal, then this judgment could potentially go away. If the appeal does still hold him accountable, then you will see um, him having to pay this full amount. And so this will kind of be a holding pattern. The real question that was how long of a holding pattern. Um, and I think that's uh, why they're trying to move so quickly with the appeal process process because they know that at some point he could be liable for the full amount. Thanks again, Maria. Have a great day. You too. South Korea is stepping up efforts and monitoring its situation within its territory after its neighbor, the North, fired a suspected intermediate range ballistic missile into the sea off its east coast. South Korea's Joint Chief of Staff said it detected the launch from Pyongyang in the early hours of today, adding it is sharing relevant information with the United States and with Japan. Japan, which confirmed the launch, urged vessels to be vigilant and report any fallen objects without approaching them. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida condemned the launch, saying North Korea had repeatedly launched ballistic missiles this year, adding it was a threat to regional security and absolutely unacceptable. A launch is a third of a ballistic missile in 2024, with North Korea saying it's testing a new intermediate-range hypersonic missile powered by a solid fuel engine. We talked about politics on the continent with Senegal's new president. But in Egypt and North Africa, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has been sworn in a third consecutive six-year term as the country's leader. He was re-elected in December with 89.6% of the vote, beating three other candidates. Swearing in ceremony was held at the new parliament buildings near the capital Cairo. His new term of six years is supposed to be his last, according to the country's constitution. 
The 69-year-old first became president in 2014, a year after he had led the military's overthrow of his Islamist predecessor, Mohamed Morsi. He is credited with implementing several mega-infrastructure projects during his tenure, but has also been criticized for a difficult economy marked by crippling debt and extreme inflation. The Egyptian pound has lost more than 50% of its value against the US dollar, creating a severe cost-of-living crisis. Staying in Egypt, the executive board of the International Monetary Fund says it has completed the first and second review of the country's extended fund facility arrangement and approved an augmentation of the original program by about $5 billion. Macroeconomic conditions since the approval of the program have been challenging with rising inflation, foreign exchange shortages and elevated debt On levels Friday, and financing yeah, needs. The Egyptian authorities have also requested a resilience and sustainability facility arrangement from the IMF. The IMF team will start the third EFF program review and RSF arrangement discussions with authorities in the next three months. On Friday, March 29th, the IMF Executive Board completed the first and second reviews of the Extended Fund Facility for Egypt and approved an augmentation of the original program by about $5 billion uh, to $8 billion in total. This decision allows the authorities to immediately draw the equivalent of about $820 million. The Egyptian authorities have put together a strong economic stabilization plan to correct imbalances, some elements of which plan are already under implementation. This economic stabilization plan is centered on a liberalized foreign exchange system in the context of a flexible exchange rate regime, a significant tightening of both fiscal and monetary policy to support the adjustment in the exchange rate, a reduction in public investment, broadly defined, and the implementation of reforms that would allow the private sector to become the engine of growth. Egypt has indeed requested access under this long-term facility to address uh, climate policies. And as a reminder, in order to proceed with uh, and qualify for access under the RSF, member countries need to have in place a strong set of of policies that uh, are intended to address the risks from, uh, from climate change. Uh, we expect to start discussing these um, uh, policies with the authorities at the time alongside of the third review, which as, as we've discussed will happen uh, in the next uh, three months. And um, of course, just like any other uh, program approval, um, the authorities' request will be subject to approval by the executive board. More political developments on the continent in Mali. Political parties are calling for a presidential election as soon as possible following the expiry of the extended transition period last month. The West African country has been ruled by a junta since August 2020 following a military coup that ousted former leader Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. In March 2022, the current junta leader, Colonel Asimi Goita, extended the transition period by 24 months to March this year but he is yet to provide a date for new elections. In a separate statement over the weekend, more than 80 political parties and civil groups called on authorities to set up an institutional framework for the elections. They threatened to use all legal and legitimate avenues for the return of normal constitutional order in the country. The junta is yet to comment on the statement. Further down south, motorists will have to dig deeper at the pumps as the price of petrol and diesel will increase for a third consecutive month in South Africa. The Development of Mineral, Department of Mineral Resources and Energy issued a statement saying petrol would increase by between 65 and 67 cents a litre, while wholesale diesel is set to increase by 3 cents. Independent economist Bonke de Moussa has attributed this to the sharp rise in international Brent crude oil prices. A 60, 65 cents or a 67 cents uh, per litre price increase for petrol and only 3 cents a litre increase in the price of, of, of diesel in the, in the inland, but in the coast there will be a decrease. So relatively, the fuel price adjustments this month in April are going to be mild. But the point you are making is it takes us back to what I was saying about administered prices, is that we keep on having these things. And the more of these fuel price increases we have, the higher the inflation are going to get. But 
in defense of government on this particular one is that the the these mild fuel price adjustments that I'm talking about have been influenced by the sharp rise in the international brand crude oil prices, which which have gone up to I mean on Friday it was at eighty seven US dollars per barrel coming from down at eighty US dollars per barrel in the in the month of of January. So those are the things and the, the rand was a little bit weaker as well. So those are the things which are influencing our fuel price increases. When we come back after the break on the world today. So the weekend was Easter weekend. Animal White House egg roll took place in Washington, D.C. Stay with us. Welcome back to the program and recycling waste in the environment is one way to keep things clean and to keep us healthy. A community in Kenya known as Kisubu has found a way to do just that and make a living out of it. Women are making hair extensions and using natural hair waste. We'll, take, we'll see more in this report. Kenyan women are cleaning up their surroundings, collecting, washing, and weaving hair extensions they grab from the streets. By weaving and braiding them, these women creatively produce rugs and doormats. Sarah Adiro is head of the weaving group at Alisim Product Development and Design Limited. She recalls how the initiative began. After learning about waste management, she and her team decided to collect hair from the roadside. After learning about waste management, we saw it fit to collect the hairs from the roadside. In doing this, we're also conserving the environment, and instead of the hairs ending up in the Lake Victoria and destroying the fishes, we saw it fit to collect and use them. Kisumu is among the five counties bordering Lake Victoria, which is Africa's largest freshwater lake. According to local media reports, due to the improper waste disposal, hair extensions eventually end up in the lake after it rains. The rugs and doormats produced help members of the group make a living. Adero says the money earned also helped pay for their school fees, food, and other commodities. A customer who purchased doormats from the group shares that she believes these hair-made products are durable, portable, and don't hold mud for a long time, making it better than the doormat she used to buy. It's very durable, they are very portable, and more so when there is rain, when you use this product, they don't hold the mud for a very long time. They are so much different from the ones which are made from the threads. The one from threads, they are, like if you wash them one or two days, one or two times, they, they start tearing off. So this one is very good. The price of the products ranges from 390 Kenyan shillings to 2,116, depending on the size. That's pretty interesting. Uh, today is the sixth anniversary of the death of South Africa's struggle icon Winnie Madikizela Mandela. Miss Madikizela Mandela will most likely be remembered for her decades-long fight for the rights of black South Africans during and after the apartheid era and as a strong and fearless symbol of resistance. She was an activist, a liberation fighter and the ex-wife of another relentless fighter, Nelson Mandela. She died today, six years ago, at the Netcare Mill Park Hospital in Johannesburg. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa, has more. A young, bold, fashionable, defied and stunning Winnie Madizela Mandela. That was her introduction to the world. As the spouse of the most well-known activist in the nation and soon-to-be political prisoner, so began the fascination with Winnie Madizela Mandela as photographers scrambled to capture her beauty. Over time, she evolved into one of the most photographed figures in the country. 
Recently, I had the opportunity to sit down with her former personal assistant, Zodwa Zwani, in Soweto. Mrs. Mandela is looking for a PA. Would you be interested? And I said, oh, I'm scared of her. But I think it would be nice to be interviewed by her. Maybe she'll give me a chance to take a picture with her. I said, okay. Give them my CV. And she did. And the following day, they called me for an interview. They told me that in my interview was the following day. <sighs> I still imagine that as if it was still yesterday. Zodwa says Madigizela Mandela was not simply a timeless beauty, but also a fashion icon in her own right. I, to be honest with you, up until now, I still feel she, she has always been the best. When it comes to style and dressing, she was, she was really the best. Then she would say, ah, by the way, tomorrow we're going to that uh, event. And what are we wearing? <laughs> one time I was wearing this green and, and white one. And I think about three people said, oh, wow, wow, you look smart. Yeah. And so when I, when I when I got to the office, she said to me, probably people told you how smart you look with my dress. <laughs> According to Zodwa, Winnie was a true Pan-African. We, we could talk about anything and everything, you see. So it's one of those things that made things uh, easier for me. And I saw that, that motherly love for everybody, not for for people in Soweto, people would come from everywhere. People would come from everywhere. I mean, even outside the country. My husband has been fighting for the liberation of the African people, for the working harmoniously of all the racial groups in this country. Known as a mother of the new South Africa, Winnie Nomzamo Mandela served as a member of parliament from 1994 to 2003 and from 2009 until her death. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channels Television News. An icon in Africa indeed. A crowd's gathered in Washington on Monday to celebrate the annual White House Easter egg roll. There we see President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden flanked by two huge rabbits as the president addressed attendees from the window of the White House. President Biden outlined the history of the event, which began over a hundred years ago at the local park, after the local park refused permission for ch the children's game and the White House hosted the egg roll instead. The events on the White House lawn includes family activities, games, and a live band. Well, we did everything, but we couldn't control the weather. Although Al Roker told me this morning it was going to get sunny. Folks, welcome to what's expected to be the biggest White House Easter egg roll ever. We just have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America. And there's nothing, nothing beyond our capacity. But God bless you all. Enjoy the day, and I'm coming down to do that Easter egg roll in just a minute. Thank you all so very, very much. Thanks, everybody. And by the way, say hello to Oyster Bunnies. Come on up, Bunnies. Get up here so they can see you. Come on, get in there. Pretty big bunny, huh? All right. Thank you all so very, very much. Kids must have had lots of fun, and I wonder what they said to the president when they had a chance to speak with him. Thanks for watching The World Today. I'm Amarachi Ubani.